What's up guys, welcome back to another reaction video. Today I will be bringing you part two of there will never ever be another driver like Dale Earnhardt. Let's get straight into this one. Uh, if you've not watched part one, I'll put the link in the description guys. I pretty much cut it quite abruptly as well. So it will need a little bit of context if you're gonna follow on from this video. So what we were actually seeing towards the end of that video was talking about uh, Dale Earnhardt's driving style. He was very rough, he did a lot of bump and runs, which were saying you bump him out of the way, so you get went into the rear of another car, bumped him out of the way, got the speed to go past him. That was his main tactic. And it was saying, now some people didn't like it, but a lot of people, like the working class, liked it because it were representing them struggling from paycheck to paycheck. He was struggling for every position, from position to position, to potentially prevail, which he did quite a lot, guys. Now, let's get straight into this reaction. Here about Lyburn. I'd really appreciate it. Let's try and hit 50 to 100 likes. If you're new around here and you've come from part one, or you're just jumping on the bandwagon at part two, I'd really appreciate it. Hit that subscribe button. It means a lot to me. We are literally so close to 7K as I record this. We should, fingers crossed, unless a lot of you guys have just disappeared, we should have hit 7K by the time I am recording this video. Well, by the time it comes out. So I'm recording it now. I haven't hit it, but I'm close. I should have hit it if projections are right by the time you're see it, seeing it. So I'm just gonna say thank you so much for that. Now, if I haven't hit it, I sound like an idiot, but thank you so, so much. You guys are absolute legends. This is a community we're building together. Now, let's check out part two. Dale Earnhardt, what we got, man, is a legend already. Hey, check. Who cares if he bangs up some other cars? He's just trying to win like the rest of them. An uneducated small town hick with no other prospects trying to turn lemons into lemonade. For anyone <laughs> stuck in rural America, Earnhardt represented the way out. Standing outside of his car, Earnhardt was just like them, but as soon as he stepped inside that black number three, he transformed into a racing god. Yep. A lot of Earnhardt's detractors pointed to his racing style as an unfair crutch, but eventually, for anyone watching long enough, his talent was undisputable. And Earnhardt loses it, goes on the grass, comes oh. back, and Earnhardt still got the lead! And what a save, man! Although Dale Earnhardt remains one of the most memorable NASCAR drivers to this day, he was never the oh. most popular driver. That distinction belonged to Bill Elliott. Oh, wow. You know, the thing of it is, I have been not the aggressive driver all my life. You know, I've tried to give it. <laughs> Yo, who's this Bill Elliott? I've heard his name about, but I've never really done a reaction to him. He was popular, man. How, how come you guys have not told me to check him out yet? You, if you have, I apologize. But damn, he was popular. the best of the thing. But when a guy cuts you off that bad and that obvious, it's time to, to take the other cheek. Awesome Bill from Dawsonville, Georgia, was in many ways a foil to Dale Earnhardt. He, too, came from a racing family and rose to prominence in the 80s as one of NASCAR's best. The soft-spoken and humble Elliot contrasted heavily with the outspoken and brash Earnhardt. Whereas Earnhardt would gain notoriety for his combative racing style, the name of Elliot's game was Speed. Over the past decade in NASCAR, the overall speeds of the race cars had gradually risen, especially yep. on the giant super speedways of Daytona and Talladega. In 1984, Cale Yarbrough became the first stock car driver in history to set a 200 mile per hour qualifying oh, lap in Daytona. The very next lap, he would lose control and total his race car. As the speeds oh. crept upwards, the drivers crept ever closer to the edge of control. Yeah, Despite 100%. the newfound risk, NASCAR's top speeds continue to climb. With each new super speedway event, engineers and crews would roll out ever so faster cars. And from 1985 oh, to 1987, no car was faster than Bill Elliott's red and white Ford Thunderbird. Perhaps his most stunning achievement came in the 1985 Winston 500, when Elliott oh. cut an oil line and fell two laps behind the leaders, only to make up the entire deficit under green and win the race. That's a fast car. That is a fast car, car was man. simply that much faster than the others. Wow. In modern times, nobody has monopolized NASCAR racing like Bill Elliott. He has raced around this season faster than a person <laughs> throwing double sixes. Two that years later in the same event, Bill Elliott would set NASCAR's all-time speed record, 212.8 miles per oh. hour. That's fast, man. That is extremely fast. For comparison, the pole speed for the Indianapolis 500 that same year the fastest open wheel race was 215. Oh, it's also important to close, note that, man. on average, a stock car weighs about twice as much as an Indy yep. car. And it's not as aerodynamic as well. There's been a pretty big elephant in the room during this whole video. So far, I've talked on and on about the history of NASCAR, but I've yet to explain why people actually like it. 
I mean, sure, it's easy to cherry pick the sport's most exciting moments. Yeah. But what about the other 99% of the time it's just regular old fashioned racing? What's the appeal of watching cars go around in circles? Well, long story short, people don't watch NASCAR for the same reasons they watch other sports. You can pick up a football and start playing right now in your backyard. You can't just hop in a NASCAR and start racing people. In order to understand the appeal of NASCAR, we have to talk about soldiers, astronauts, and prestige. Okay. Being a soldier comes with a certain amount of prestige. Most people find their sacrifice admirable, but you don't have to search far to find people who disagree. You'd be hard pressed, however, to find anyone who doubts the prestige of an astronaut. I mean, I personally, maybe it's just the people I speak to and I never really bring it up. I've never actually spoke to someone who doesn't like the army. In terms of not what the army does, people can be against that. In terms of a serviceman, like, you've got to say fair play. Like, that is brave, courageous, and saying, I think I'd be petrified to do. So I've got to say fair play to any serviceman out there. And I hope that's not going against the serviceman. Um... Because I've never personally seen that. Again, I apologise if it is all over the place and I, see, I sound like an idiot seeing that. But I think that's a little bit disrespectful. People putting their lives in the line potentially for your country as well. Obviously, if they've done something majorly wrong, opinions can change. I'm not saying I'm just saying the general one. Done the service, hero, is what I'm saying. Okay? Uh, let me know in the comments about that one. I'm not really sure. And again, astronaut. Who doesn't want to be an astronaut? Even though it would be scary as hell, that'd be insane. What an experience. That'd be insane. Maybe one day. I highly doubt it. Like, extremely doubt it. But you never know. Stranger things have happened. You can talk about intelligence and science degrees and technical skill all you want. But the fact of the matter is that soldiers fight against other soldiers in man-made wars. While yep. astronauts fight against the surly bonds of nature itself. Yeah, that's incredible. It takes bravery to volunteer yourself to go fight in some far-off foreign land. But it takes a whole nother level of bravery to strap yourself into a pressurized metal canister and fly out of the top of the sky. Very true. Astronauts have so much prestige because they come the closest to kissing the snarling jaws of certain death. That's incredible. There's no denying that war is also deadly, but humans have been fighting and killing each other since the dawn of man. It's easy to understand the nature of warfare. It's difficult to understand the limits of nature itself. And nothing yeah, makes sense. is more terrifying than what we don't understand. Ah, who am I kidding? This is a dumb analogy. NASCAR drivers <laughs> are nothing like astronauts. I mean, come on. Have you ever seen a NASCAR fly? Yeah. Oh, yes, we have. If you want to see a NASCAR fly, check out Airborne Crashes. Just search Beasley Airborne Crashes. Don't check out anyone else's. Check out the original video, but check out Beasley's reaction. I'd really appreciate it. And I imagine a lot of you legends have already seen it. Let me know in the comments if you have. In the race immediately corresponding with Bill Elliott's record-breaking qualifying lap, Bobby Allison would blow a tire in the trioval. The back of his car would lift off the ground and sail into the catch fence at nearly 200 miles oh. per hour. Oh, thank God it turns out good that if you spin a car sideways at a fast enough speed, the aerodynamics will force the car aloft like the wing of an airplane. Yeah. In the 1987 Winston 500, the 210 mile per hour pace was enough to lift up Bobby Allison's 3,500 pound race car like a piece of paper. For a brief, surreal moment, all of NASCAR stood still. By pure chance, Allison's left front fender clipped the wall the instant oh, before the back of his car wow. hit the catch fence, which redirected the momentum of his car away from the spectators. That's amazing. Had Allison That's amazing. spun at just a slightly different angle, we could have witnessed a tragedy on the scale of the 1955 Le Mans disaster, where an out-of-control race car was projected into the stands at a very high speed. 83 spectators were killed in the catastrophe, leading many European nations to place a temporary ban on all motorsports. Wow, I never to knew that. To this day, it remains the deadliest accident in racing history. Holy, I never knew that. Allison's car had sheared a 100. And when I say incredible, incredibly horrible. Like, that shouldn't be, you shouldn't be going to sport and not coming away from it. We go to sport for an enjoyment. It's so sad that people do sometimes, unfortunately, for whatever reason, go to sport and don't come back. It's honestly heartbreaking. And I never knew that. And yeah, wow. Foot gap in the protective fencing. And NASCAR fans found themselves staring into an eerie window of what could have happened. Miraculously, only five spectators were injured and no one was killed. The line amazing. between driver Absolutely and spectator amazing. had been severed and it could have ended NASCAR entirely. Fortunately, NASCAR would make good use of their second chance as yep. the era of speed came to a permanent end.
Restrict this to accident base, baby. would force NASCAR to implement restrictor plates at all future super speedway races, which would limit the horsepower of all cars to keep them below dangerous speeds. This would profoundly change the way drivers raced at Daytona and Talladega. Gone were the days of Bill Elliott making up yep. five miles under green. Restrictor plates made it so that cars could no longer pull away from each other, instead emphasizing the attractive effects of slipstream. Simple Drafted. racing moves such as passing were now drastically altered as timing and aerodynamics were now much more important than speed and handling. Restrictor ate it all up. It, it made everybody the same speed, and that made it uh, probably more dangerous than, than when we were running 210. Naturally, many drivers were unhappy with this new change, and no driver hated restrictor plate racing more than Dale Earnhardt. As slow as all of us were running, probably trouble everywhere. Which was a little odd, considering he was the best restrictor plate racer on the planet. Oh, wow. You know, that shows you a true driver and a, a true racer. The fact that, I know I'm pausing a lot, I apologize for that, but the fact that he is winning all these races with restrictor plates and potentially is the best restrictor plate driver ever. And he's still saying, no, I got into this business because I want to race fast and hard and fair. Obviously, it's fair because everyone's got restrictor plates, but that's what he wants. And you can't take the race out of someone, no matter how much they're winning. If he wants a proper race, he'll try his best to get it, and I respect that. A lot of greens. <laughs> wow. It was one of the most dominant runs of any race category in motorsports history, and it happened during a time when NASCAR had arguably its toughest ever competition. The 90s truly were a golden age of NASCAR and popular culture. Attendance and television ratings steadily rose as movies like Days of Thunder drew intrigue from across the nation. Big brands and TV networks were lining up to capture their own slice of the booming NASCAR scene. NASCAR had gone fully national, and it had fundamentally transformed itself from a simple showcase of speed in the prior decade. The sponsors, drivers, tracks, and cars had all changed, but one thing remained the same. Dale Earnhardt was dominating the competition. From 1990 to 1994, Dale Earnhardt would win four more cup championships, tying Richard Petty's record of seven, a record considered by many to be untouchable just 10 years prior. With each new championship, it became harder and harder for people to disregard Earnhardt's success. Yeah, Although definitely. many still resented his racing style, you can't win seven NASCAR championships without being a pretty talented driver. Earnhardt's detractors were simply running out of excuses to deny his greatness. Soon, there was only one thing keeping Dale out of the conversation for the greatest of all time. Yo, whoa, whoa. I know what it is. I think I know what it is. The Daytona 500 win. It's gotta be. Let's go. He's in my noise. If it is, I'm gonna be so happy. Have you, you've not won Daytona, right? I've won the Daytona <laughs> yes. Firecracker race in July, but I haven't won the Daytona 500. That's like the Super Bowl race for us. After 17 years Did he win it in 98? 98, I believe. Or maybe 2000. Daryl Waltrip, he's done it. In 1989, Daryl Waltrip won his first and only Daytona 500 in his 17th attempt. At the time, he was considered the best driver to never win it. And after oh, he wow. did, everyone was left to wonder about the next best driver to take Waltrip's place. Immediately, many thought of Dale Earnhardt, who had yet to win the Daytona 500 after 11 tries. But yep. surely in 1990, while entering the final corner of the final lap in first place, after leading three quarters of the race, Earnhardt could put the narrative to rest. They still bit. run single file, halfway down the back straightaway, half a lap to go. Still, Earnhardt now stretching his lead by another car length over Cope. The body can't do anything with Cope either. Earnhardt's car blows up! Oh, oh you gotta be Earnhardt's good, lead. man! Outside, it is car number 10. Derek Cope, something to miss on the Earnhardt car. Coming to the line, it's Labonte. Wow. Heartbreak, man. Dale, what the heck happened on the last lap? We ran over some debris and cut a right rear tire down, David. Uh, just a quarter of a lap away from victory. In 1991, Earnhardt would damage his car after hitting a seagull, forcing him to pit. 
he would battle all the way back to second place before crashing with two laps to go. Oh, Dale good, Earnhardt mate. Fails to win the Daytona 500 again. again. In 1992, Earnhardt would get caught up in a crash that wasn't his fault. A newfound consequence of restrictor plate racing were massive crashes that would often wipe out over a dozen cars. After a while, these crashes seemed almost inevitable due to the extremely close pack racing that now resembled rush hour traffic, but at 190 <laughs> miles per hour. Yeah. One slight error by a single driver could spark a chain reaction that would take many cars out of the race. It was one of Earnhardt's main reasons for hating restrictor plate racing, and he would fall victim to it numerous times. In 1993, Earnhardt would once again lead most of the race, only to finish second after Dale Jarrett passed him on the final lap. After a 7th place finish in 94, Earnhardt would finish second again in 1995, and again in 1996. Later in the 96 season, Earnhardt would suffer a horrific looking crash that sent his number 3 Chevy tumbling down the Talladega front stretch. I mean, that's scary because that's really, that's honestly reminds me of the fatal 2001 crash. And it shows how dangerous it is. That's horrible, man. Oh, no safety walls, man. Dale Earnhardt attempting to walk to the ambulance as he walks away. That's from good to see at least, man. Incidents in his racing career. While it was known that Dale Earnhardt hated restrictor plate racing, it was starting to look like restrictor plate racing hated him. <laughs> All those frustrating years for Earnhardt, so close, so many times, when it should have been his, and it wasn't. If we get the right help, we're at the right place at the right times. like I just told Richard, I said, what do you think? You know him better than I do. He said, I've been here a lot of times before, and uh, you can bet he's been in the floor pan right now with that throttle pedal, but if it's racing God's time to shine on that three, we'll just have to see. As was the formula at this point, Earnhardt ran up front all day and found himself in a battle for the lead with just a few laps to go. And all of a sudden, he found himself on his roof once again. Oh, Jared's loose. Oh. Down the back straight away. Big trouble, Earnhardt. Indeed. Up and over number three. And for the 19th time, 19th, man. Deals a bad hand. I'm not sure I actually believe in curses, but Dale Earnhardt's misfortune in the Daytona 500 really made me consider it. For 100%. some wicked reason, the seven-time NASCAR champion and best super speedway racer in the world could not, for the life of him, win this one super speedway race. Earnhardt's gut-wrenching futility at this one event is made even more insane when you consider that he's the winningest driver in the history of the track. No, seriously. By 1997, Earnhardt had won pretty much every stock car event at Daytona multiple times over. I think I didn't know. That is incredible. And he'd never won a 500. That is a curse. I know he gets a eventually, but that is a All curse. All except the one that mattered most. After 19 tries and 19 failures, he should have been completely discouraged. But Dale Earnhardt was not a quitting man. He I wasn't love that. even willing to quit this race. What a pile of grit. Earnhardt is in the car. Give over, man. This thing is so beat up. If Earnhardt can make one lap or two, it's an absolute miracle. Even though he <laughs> no longer had any chance of winning, Dale Earnhardt would hop out of the ambulance and back into his mangled car to finish the race. When faced with the lowest moment of his career, Dale Earnhardt did what he always did. He waited for an opportunity and pushed forward. Wow. I mean, it was not yet, he wouldn't, you yeah. know. Has a benefit, there's a slow car up ahead. And there's trouble coming off a of turn two. Some cars get on, lad. Whoever gets back to the start finish line, they'll get the white and the yellow together. 20 Go on, years Dale. of trying, 20 years of frustration. Dale Earnhardt will come to the caution flag awesome. to win the Daytona Fire. Awesome, man. Finally, every man on every crew has come out to the edge of pit lane to congratulate the man who has dominated everything there is to win in this sport except this race until today they used to boo dale earnhardt when he was winning too much that'll happen if you dominate any sport 100 today when they introduced the intimidator the crowd was full of cheers for all them race fans and all them people have been saying dale this is your year dale this is your year and boy a lot of them said it this year the Daytona 500 is ours. <laughs> we've won it. We've won it. We've won it. Awesome, man. 
The hangover from Earnhardt's Daytona 500 victory lasted throughout the 1998 season, where Dale would not win another race and finish a distant eighth in points. Wow. Perhaps overcoming the single greatest foe in his racing career was a little demotivating. Yep. After winning the 500, Earnhardt had almost nothing left to accomplish. He could have tried for another championship, breaking the tie with Richard Petty, but both he and a lot of others began to tell that his age was starting to get the best of him. Later in the 98 season, Earnhardt suffered his second hard crash at Talladega in two years. In the post-race interview, Earnhardt for the first time ever sounded fed up, exhausted, and demoralized. What was the day like up to that point? It was good. It's not good racing, though. Y'all can talk about all you want. It ain't good racing. In 1999, Earnhardt would infamously dump Terry Labonte to win at Bristol. Leader change, and Labonte takes the lead. And meanwhile, Ricky Rudd trying to... Oh, and Earnhardt... You know, he did what he had to do to win the race. Fair play to him, I guess. We are going to leave it here because there's less than 20 minutes left. And what we'll do is this is probably about a 16, maybe with all my waffling, probably a 22 minute part. So we'll leave it here. Dale Earnhardt winning at Bristol. And also, that's a fantastic way to mention Bristol is this weekend, guys. Do you want to see a watch along? But there's a couple conditions. I will happily do a watch along because I really enjoy him. Condition one. If it's rain, I can't do it. I am working on my Monday, and obviously it's quite late, so it's going to be a push and shove. It has to be a non-rain, and obviously if there's a major delay, unfortunately I have to cut the uh, stream short. That just is how it is. Let me know in the comments about that. On this, we're going to get into it. It's going to get pretty dark, I imagine, very, very soon in part three. Uh, let me know when you want to see it. Do you want to see it probably in another 48 interval like this one is? Or this one might have been in... 72 hours actually, 72 hour interval. The same as what we did between part one and part two, guys. Let me know in the comments. Um, I'd really appreciate it. But yeah, wow, what an absolute guy. I'm glad he finally got his Daytona 500. We knew he did win it eventually. Uh, it's awesome seeing the build up, all the failures. It's also very scary to see the two crashes which he's had before, obviously the fatal one. Very similar, very dangerous, and without the safety balance, it's horrific to see. Let me know in the comments what you thought about this part, guys. I'd really appreciate it. Have a fantastic day, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.